Check it out. Okay, everyone. I hope this crusty table is in full HD. This is what we're doing today. We got the magnetic stir plate that is broken, not working anymore. We got the DIY bioreactor that actually does work still. Uh, it's got the stir bar <laughs> salvaged from it though. A little DC motor and these switches that make me very, very happy. Okay, I think I'm done. I've made an enormous mess. This is it right here, not that. So you can see we have our two switches. We have our display. We have a little DC motor in here that I need to put magnets on for the stir plate. Our little Arduino just glued to the wall. Our blower motor, and I have tubing for that as well. This goes to the power cable. This goes to the temperature probe. This is what the temperature probe looks like. I made sure it has a long cable so that it actually fits in whatever container we're using. It's got a power switch on the side. Nice. Okay, let's try this switch. Okay, so that's turning on the blower motor. And this one. Okay, so that turns on the stir plate. It looks ugly, but it's actually working pretty well. This motor still may be a little too fast. Okay, so it's a few days later now, and I think everything is done. Here is the motor. Uh, please don't kill me. Okay, so it, it moves at a, at a pretty good speed. And when I actually put the lid on, and I use my stir bar, That looks like the perfect speed. So the secret to slow the motor down was using this voltage regulator right here. So this is a three volt voltage regulator. It's an LD33V. Usually when you use five volt voltage regulators, you have some capacitors between the legs. But in this case, I guess I didn't need them. All the circuits I saw online, you didn't need them. So I didn't use one. So we got everything running. Let me turn it off because it's a little loud. So this is the air line. So you see the air bubbles stop there but the little stir bar is still going strong and I can turn it off and it slowly spins to a stop. That's everything working. The air is working, the stirring is working, the temperature is working. This is awesome. Got the peristaltic pump working, little pump. He's uh, back from retirement. Everything's working well. It just needs to all be put together. I'll probably do that tomorrow. I just wanted to talk about some of the things that went wrong with the stir plate. There were a lot of issues. The original video that I made was kind of crap uh, <laughs> uh, because I used potentiometers instead of rheostats. If you're going to make a stir plate yourself, use rheostats. Don't use potentiometers because they don't work. After I added the voltage regulator to the motor, for the stir plate, it was still spinning a little bit too fast. And so at first I thought the issue was, you know, this container is a little bit concave, so the stir bar has to sit a little higher up. So I tried my little flask here with the flat bottom, mostly flat bottom, and that worked a little bit better. And so I kept trying to use, you know, bigger and bigger stir bars, thinking that you know, the magnets would sort of have more to hold on to if it was a bigger stir bar. It's the other way around. If you're ever going to do this yourself, use smaller stir bars if your motor is going too fast. It might be a good way to sort of throttle the mixing rather than having a rheostat here, which I don't have on hand. I just use this switch. So I can just change the size of the stir bar, you know, because I plan on doing continuous applications with this so it would constantly be on at one speed anyway so if i have to dial in the speed before the experiment starts it's not that big of a deal okay so everything's working well so hopefully this cuts to tomorrow where i have some kombucha in here hello everyone this is crazy american hacker and welcome to my laboratory i mean laboratory okay so sorry about the 3d printer noise in the background but everything is set up in the lab, what is what we'll call it. So the way that I'm going to track the effectiveness of our sort of bioreactor thing is I'm gonna brew some kombucha in the traditional batch way, and then I'm gonna brew some kombucha in the bioreactor. So the bioreactor, uh, it does a few things. It gives, hopefully, us more control of the reactor conditions than a traditional batch process. And in the control that we have, it inherently gives us a little bit more reaction speed or, or growth rate in this case. So the way that we're gonna measure that <laughs> our DIY bioreactor is way better than the stupid way of 
brewing it in a little jar with a cute little cloth on top is that we're going to measure the pH. So the reason I want to use kombucha is because, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to grow. You know, it's bacteria and yeast colony, very low chance of contamination. And there is a trait of the growth rate that we can easily measure with really, really cheap tests. Now this will give us really low resolution of what's actually going on between the two different processes, but it will at least give us an idea of what's happening. So I started this brew I think two days ago, so the pH should still be pretty high. I'm going to take you know, some of this, maybe a cup or two, fill it up to probably this line, throw in the stir bar, I'll throw in the air line just so that it's blowing air into the vessel you know, but not bubbling it through. And we'll let that go probably for a couple of days just to make sure that this is all working properly. And then after the day or two, we're gonna start adding our fresh tea. So I'll follow the same recipe that I normally use when I make kombucha. And so essentially what this is gonna be is a fed batch process. So this is what it's called in industry, fed batch process. And all this really means is that we have a batch process going on, but <laughs> you know, we're feeding in more substrate so that we can maintain the growth of our organism at its optimal growth rate. So when you do a traditional batch process, maybe I can add a graph on the screen or something like that. When you run a traditional batch pr process, there's a lag phase where it takes a minute for the organisms to figure out what's going on. And then you'll enter this exponential growth phase. And then once most of the substrate is consumed, it will start slowing down and if you're lucky, it will just slow down. And if you're unlucky, you'll start a death phase where the cells actually start dying out because of low nutrients. So what a fed batch process can achieve is an extended duration of the exponential phase. So by controlling exactly how much fresh media is in the container, then you can keep it within that range of substrate concentration to maintain that exponential growth rate and hopefully grow the organism faster. So anyway, that's the theory behind it. I'm gonna test the pH of this. So you see, we already have a SCOBY forming just a little bit. If you aren't familiar with kombucha, it's a colony of bacteria and fungi, usually yeast and acetobacter variety, but there's also several other varieties of organisms in the broth. The very basic mechanism is that the yeast turn the sugar into alcohol, and then the bacteria turn the alcohol into acids usually acetic acid, some gluconic acid, and other organic acids as well. Anyway, let's test the pH. So red is a little bit acidic. So you can see we're sitting at a pH of probably around four and a half. That's what I would guess. Kombucha will probably get down to a pH of two or three, so we have some resolution here to actually check if our brew is you know, finished, or at least progressing in the right direction. Okay, now I'm gonna set up the bioreactor. Okay, so it's all wrapped up just like the other one, except it's got a temperature probe and an air line. The air line is dangling in right there, and the temperature probe goes all the way down. It's got a stir bar in there, so let's turn this guy on. So there's the temperature. We have our air buzzing through. And there's our stir bar going. You can really only hear it right now. There you go, you see the vortex going right there. Cool, so that's going. We'll let that go for a few hours, check on it, make sure everything's okay. Then let it go for a day or two, make sure everything's okay. And then we will proceed with the fed batch reaction. Okay, so it's been about 24 hours and everything is still running. The stir bar is still going. It did stop at one point, so I had to move it around a little bit, but it's running fine now. The air pump is still going temperature is still working well and I took a little sample of both of them I didn't really expect the pH to be much different here are the results that we got from that you can see they're almost indistinguishable which one is which this one is from the batch and this one is from the bioreactor setup so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a little pump get him all set up uh, try to set him to the lowest setting let it run for you know 30 minutes or something and check on the level and make sure it's not going too fast what I'll probably end up having to do is just a couple of times a day or something, let it run for 30 minutes or an hour to raise the level just a little bit because I don't think I can get it to a low enough setting to fill it up over you know, four days or something like that, which would be ideal. Really what I need to do is incorporate Lil Pump into the DIY bioreactor setup so that I can control 
when the peristaltic pump turns on and puts more solution into the fed batch process. Okay, so here is my terrifying creation. I have this pot of warm tea basically. Hopefully it'll keep things sterile. There's low pump. The hose is coming through low pump up and into here. You can see it's dripping kind of quickly. Might need to slow it down a little bit actually. That's not bad right there. I had to lift the pot up a little bit just so there's more head. If you watch the video about low pump, you'll know all about head. Uh, this is working, the stir bar is working, the temperature is still working, the air pump is still flowing right there. We have our fed batch going right here. Here is the level right now. It's a little bit below this first line. I'm gonna cover this up with the little towel let it run for probably 15 minutes, come check on it, and then evaluate from there. So the setup worked pretty well. It's been about four or five days now, and I would come in here and turn on the peristaltic pump for 15 to 30 minutes, twice or three times a day, uh, and I think it went really well. So let's check the pH of both the batch fermentation in the back and then the fed batch in the front. Okay, so here are the results, and you can see that the, the pH is probably a four, and you probably can't tell which one is which. This one right here is the batch fermentation, and this one right here is the fed batch fermentation. And there's a lot of places I messed up, so let's, let's go through a few of them. The first one is, I stopped this batch process a little bit early. You can see the level only got to maybe, uh, you know, a third of how full it could have been because the tea that I was using got a little bit of contamination in there. You know, I wasn't planning on drinking this anyway, so it's probably not that big of a deal, and it was inevitable. And I checked the pH of this, and the pH is uh, neutral, so, you know, there's no issue there with skewing the results at the very least. The other issue is a little bit more complicated. I'll explain it on the whiteboard. So what happened was I started with this batch reactor, which started with about 20% starter culture and then what i did is i took about 10 percent of this and put it into this tank so that's what this bracket here represents and what this dotted line is is the actual amount of starter that the fed batch reactor would have received so you know very roughly it received about one fourth of the starter solution that I gave the batch reactor. So it started with less cells. So let's look at what influence starting with less cells would have on the fermentation process. So I had to dig up my old bioengineering notebook and this is the equation for the number of cells in a reactor. This is a very basic equation. People dedicate their careers to studying cell growth rates and every organism is different but this is a very basic exponential growth rate so x represents our concentration of cells x0 represents the initial concentration of cells e is that number 2.7 something mu is the growth rate and t is time so it's e raised to the growth rate times time the growth rate and the time both have a larger influence because they're being raised to this exponential. But in our case, since we're comparing the same consortium of cells, our mu, our growth rate, and our time are both the same, so we don't have to worry about those. The only thing that's different is going to be our initial concentration of cells. So that's important. When we graph this, of course, we get something that looks exponential. So don't look at the dotted line for a second. Here's our exponential graphs. And they're gonna be exactly the same, except our X naught is gonna be higher in our batch reactor because we started with more cells, but the shape of the graph is going to be the same. So the only thing that's changing is that the graph is shifting up with the batch reactor relative to the fed batch reactor. So you can see that as time goes on, this gap doesn't really close very much. And you know, you could graph this yourself and it might look a little bit different, but the gap between them isn't gonna close very much. These dotted lines here represent what an actual growth rate would be. You know, you'd have this exponential growth and then eventually the cells would start to die off. And I talked about this a little bit earlier in the video, but in the fed batch reactor, you know, potentially you could continue that exponential growth if you are continuously feeding in more substrate. Back to Nick in the past. So yeah, essentially this one started with less culture than that one so this one started with less initial cells so it was at a huge disadvantage 
Uh, so hopefully in the next round I can fix that. Some other things that I would definitely fix is sterilize the media much better first. I need to get a new peristaltic pump or build a better one. And if I build one, then I can incorporate it into the system to give you know pulses regularly rather than randomly. Another thing that happened is the stir bar actually broke. So when you flip this switch, nothing happens anymore. I might have fried the voltage regulator or, or maybe I fried the motor. Not really sure, but that needs to be fixed. So, you, you know, there's the argument of, you know, garbage in equals garbage out. I'm using garbage tools, so I'm getting garbage results. And I think that's kind of true, and it's true in a lot of cases, but I think, you know, I learned a lot here, and there's a lot of features that I know now that I need in the next iteration. So, again, the next iteration, you know, everything should be incorporated into one piece. I think that's really important. You know, I need better holders for the hoses and, and things like that, better media sterilization, better control of the two different experiments. You know, no experiment's going to be perfect. So anyway, hopefully the inspiration here is, you know, this guy did a crap job at what he's doing. I can do it way better than that. And then you go out and prove me wrong. So, you know, you know hopefully people are out there saying this guy's dumb. You know, I'm going to prove him wrong and uh, show him that this experiment can be done much better. So anyway, hope you learned something. I'll see you in the next video.